This video is the second part of the overview of ascending and descending pathways and here we will be concentrating on descending pathways. Descending pathways control movements, muscle tone and posture and they also modulate reflex mechanisms. Two terms which we commonly use while discussing the descending pathways are the upper motor neuron and lower motor neurons. The lower motor neurons are the alpha motor neurons which are located in the ventral grey horn of the spinal cord or in the motor nuclei of cranial nerves. These are the final common pathways which innervate the extrafusal muscle fibers in the skeletal muscle. Upper motor neurons on the contrary are all those neurons and their descending pathways which influence the activity of these lower motor neurons. And in the clinical parlance, however, the term upper motor neuron is commonly referred to corticospinal and corticobulbar neurons, which control fine fractionated movements like speech and hand movements. We already know that cerebral cortex has predominantly contralateral representation, whereas the spinal and cranial nerves carry ipsilateral information. So, similar to ascending fibers, the descending tract fibers also need to cross over to the opposite side. This crossing over is generally referred to as decussation. Let us see how the corticospinal and corticobulbar pathways will be travelling through the central nervous system. S similar to the sensory area, different parts of the body are represented in the designated area of primary motor cortex called as motor homunculus. So both corticospinal and corticobulbar tract fibers start from the designated body represented areas from the primary motor cortex as well as from the adjacent cortical areas. They descend down through the internal capsule transit through the brainstem where they cross to the opposite side and synapse either directly with the alpha motor neurons or indirectly via the interneurons. Upper motor neurons are commonly involved in stroke whereas lower motor neurons are more commonly involved in diseases like motor neuron disease, diabetes or any other disease causing peripheral neuropathy. Both lower motor neuron lesion and upper motor neuron lesion result in classical presentations. In lower motor neuron lesion, always it is ipsilateral presentation. There is paresis or paralysis of specific muscles. Muscle tone is reduced tendon reflex activity is decreased or almost absent resulting in areflexia. With time, these muscles undergo atrophy. We can also observe fasciculations that is spontaneous contraction of a small group of muscle fibers in a paralyzed muscle. We can also observe fibrillations that is electrical activity in the paralyzed muscle during electromyography. And Babinski sign is always negative here. In case of upper motor neuron lesion, the presentation can be on the contralateral side or the ipsilateral side depending upon the site of the lesion. If the site of the lesion is before the decussation, then the, represent, the presentation will be on the contralateral side. If the site of the lesion is after the decussation, then the presentation will be on the ipsilateral side. Here, there is paralysis of movements. Initially, there is flaccid paralysis. This is followed by spastic paralysis after a couple of weeks. Usually, it affects anti-gravity muscles like biceps, quadriceps in the lower limb. Unlike in lower motor neuron lesion, here there is increased tendon reflex activity. However, abdominal re reflex will be absent. Atrophy of muscles is not seen here because individual muscles are not paralyzed. 
clonus is a feature of upper motor neuron lesion and Babinski sign will be positive. When we say deep tendon reflexes, how do we elicit them? As a physician, you will be placing your finger on the tendon of either biceps or triceps or brachioradialis or the tendon, uh, ligamentum patellae or the tendon of quadriceps or tendo Achilles of the patient and tap your finger gently using the knee haver which is shown here. Normally there is a reflex contraction of these muscles due to stretch reflex. In case of upper motor neuron lesion this contraction will be exaggerated and brisk. Whereas in case of lower motor neuron lesion there is absence of contraction. How do we elicit Babinski sign? Stroke the sole of the foot of the patient using a blunt pointed object like a tip of a key in the direction shown in this diagram. A normal response is the flexor response wherein all the toes will plant a flex. In case of upper motor neuron lesion however there is an extensor response wherein the great toe is extended and the rest of the toes will spread out. So this is called as positive Babinski sign. Classic feature of upper motor neuron lesion. How do we elicit clonus? Passively dorsiflex the ankle or extend the wrist. This will result in rhythmic flexion at the ankle or wrist at the rate of 5 to 10 contractions per minute. That jerky rhythmic movement is what we call as clonus. Again, a classic feature of upper motor neuron lesion. Upper motor neuron lesion has a, another classic feature called as spasticity. Spasticity is nothing but combination of paralysis, hypertonia and increased tendon reflexes. A typical clasp knife spasticity is seen in upper motor neuron lesion. When we say clasp knife rigidity, Whenever we try to passively move a part of the limb, there is rigidity in the initial stages and then there is sudden release of resistance at the end, like how you feel the resistance while opening the clasp knife. That's what we call it as a clasp knife rigidity, again a classic feature of upper motor neuron lesion. <coughs> Pure corticospinal tract lesion is rare in human beings because it is surrounded by so many other tracts traveling in the same path. But if you can experimentally create the lesion of pure corticospinal tract alone, it will result only in deficits in the fine fractionated movement and Babinski sign positive. All other signs which we have listed here under the UMN lesion are actually because of involvement of surrounding descending tracts. So which are the surrounding descending tracts? They are any corticofugal tracts like corticoreticular, corticopontine, corticorubral, etc. or those tracts which originate in the brainstem like reticulospinal, vestibulospinal, rubrospinal, olivospinal, etc. In addition to these descending tracts, two other regions influence the motor activities. One is the basal ganglia or better named as basal nuclei and the second one is the cerebellum. Lesion of the basal nuclei will result in bradykinesia that is slowing down of the movements or dyskinesia wherein it is a beginning of a new unwanted movement. Lesion of the cerebellum on the contrary will result in ataxia Ataxia is nothing but incoordination of movements, hypotonia and intention tremor. That is tremor which is set into motion only when the person begins to do a movement. So with intention the tremor is set on. So this is again a classical feature of cerebellar lesion. So thank you very much. We will be going into detail of all these descending tracks in the later videos. This was just an introductory part. You can visit this site for other similar videos.